I invite you to pray with me and for me. God, you know what it is that we need, the ways that we hunger and thirst. Be with us in this time of worship that we might receive what it is that we need, that we might hear a word from you through or in spite of all that's said or done in Christ's name. Amen. So this week, we're continuing our This Is My Body series, recognizing how Jesus, the eternal word of God, came to us in the flesh, becoming fully human, even as he was always and has always been and continues to be fully divine. And as we remember this through this season of Lent, it becomes an invitation for us to be in right relationship, not only with God, but with our own bodies, because we've inherited quite the mixed bag when it comes to thinking about our bodies. As Christians, there's a long tradition of honoring human bodies and holding them sacred. After all, for us, as United Methodists, our two sacraments, those two great mysteries that we consider means of God's grace for us, baptism and what we're going to have in just a moment, Holy Communion, are just holy expressions of how we wash bodies, of how we feed bodies. But we also know that our faith has struggled with uneasiness about the body. Many faithful folks have experienced a kind of Christianity that denies the goodness of their bodies, that we must starve ourselves, that we must deny ourselves any experiences of pleasure or delight because that must be wrong, that must be evil. Beloved, why would God have given us these magnificent gifts, this embodied experience, if it was bad, if it was something to deny our whole lives? After all, it was God who called all of us into being took a look at our ancestors in their bodies and said, wow, that is really good. I think I've outdone myself there. Eh, That's my interpretation. We are not just spiritual beings having a temporary embodied experience. We are full selves and at our best, We live as an integrated whole, not treating the body like a prison or an afterthought or a perpetual fixer-upper project. So this week, as I mentioned with our youngest disciples, we're going to turn our attention to a time when Jesus got thirsty. Human beings are thirsty creatures. Our bodies vary, but an adult's body is somewhere in the range of 55 to 60 percent water. We can survive for a week without food, but only three days without water. We have to have water to survive. Just a couple of years ago, our state faced the worst drought in over a decade. Do y'all remember this? It meant that households were trying to balance water restrictions with trying to make sure they didn't crack their foundation of the house. Ranchers were selling off cattle herds because The high price of water meant that they couldn't keep their livestock in good condition. There were failing crops for farmers and increased wildfire threats for firefighters. Closer to home, y'all might remember that the city of Gunter was in danger of running out of water for its residents because two of its water wells malfunctioned due to a continuous command demand. They were not meant to run continually for days, but that was what was happening in the face of extreme heat and drought conditions. So right here in North Texas, we know what it is to be thirsty in need of water. I mean, just this last week, many of us watched with horror as wildfires swept across the Texas panhandle. And while we don't know what started that fire, the dry grass, the strong winds, and the warm temperatures sped it up until it became the largest fire in recorded state history. Now, we did get a little rain and a little snow that fell on Thursday, and that helped. But we continue to hold this area in our prayers because the danger isn't over yet. We need water to keep life in balance. 
Jesus was familiar with this part of human life. So let us listen for a word from God as we read our scripture for today from the Gospel of John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither here on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or what are you, why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this truly is the Savior of the world." For Jesus, this thirsty day was an opportunity rather than a terror. It was a chance to give out of abundance rather than to panic, to fill an emptiness. Jesus could have let differences between him and the woman from Samaria keep him away from her, but his body knew a truth deeper than externally constructed boundaries. He was thirsty, there was a well, And she had a bucket. His thirst opened an avenue for relationship greater than the prejudices he'd heard and learned growing up. He chose to offer his vulnerability and his need to create a place where they could connect. Whatever their differences, these two human bodies had that in common. They both need water. Now, most sermons I've heard about this text, maybe that you've heard too, focus on the woman, who she is, 
what she's done, and the exact nature of her sin that leads her to have to draw water at noon, a hot, wretched time of day for this chore. That's like going out at noon in Texas in August and saying, you know what sounds great right now? An outdoor chore. No one would choose to go get water from the well at this time. And while those things are all interesting, I think there's a more important lesson to be had here. A lot of ink has been spilled to say that this is a story about Jesus forgiving her sexual sinfulness. But I suggest that this story is about a different kind of intimacy, a different kind of encounter between Jesus and all of us sinners who find ourselves dry and thirsty and in need. The original hearers of this story would have known that those Samaritans, well, they're like a one-off people. They're not quite right. They're the offspring of the Jews who were left behind when the well-educated ruling and teaching class of the Jewish kingdom was carried off into exile by Babylon. Many of the Jews who were left in Judah married people of the neighboring territories, blending their understanding of the God of Israel with other worship practices. And then after the fall of Babylon to the Persian king Cyrus the Great, the exiled Jews began to return to the land of Judah. They began to rebuild the temple and considered those that had stayed behind, those that had continued to live in the land and have their families, well, they were unfaithful. That's why the woman says to Jesus, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the pe place that people have to worship is in Jerusalem. She's picking up an old argument between Jews and Samaritans, the dividing line in their worship practice. We know, I think we all know, how passionate folks can become when the issue being disputed is the proper practice of religion. As United Methodists, we've just passed through a season when some of our beloved kindred decided that we couldn't worship together anymore and it was time for them to leave our denomination. So it should be no surprise to us that this woman, when she meets a Jew sitting by the well who wants something of her, the first thing she asks him, hey, what do you think is right? Where is the place to worship God? In the bones of their mixed heritage, Samaritans shared many of the same foundational stories with Jews. The woman references this well as the woman given this well as the one given by their common ancestor Jacob. Now, unfortunately, some of the most bitter disputes arise between those who share some history in common. But looking back through Scripture, wells are usually a place of betrothal. Abraham's servant found Rebecca for Isaac when she offered him a drink from the water she'd drawn from a well. Jacob rolled a stone aside from the mouth of a well so Rachel could water her sheep. Moses sat down by a well in Midian, defended the priest's daughters from some unruly shepherds so they could draw water for their flock and ended up marrying the priest's daughter, Zipporah. So to an ancient audience, when you start a story by saying, so a guy sat down next to a well, they're like, oh, it's a meat cute. My favorite, a romantic comedy. This is going to be wonderful. And Jesus may not woo the woman as we expect, but he does woo the whole nation, the whole people of Samaria. Jesus is the bridegroom and calls all people, not just Jews, to covenant faithfulness. He knows them and loves them just like he knows us and loves us. God has been calling humankind into relationships since the beginning. So Jesus crosses all barriers to get to us. God took on flesh and blood, wrapping eternity in humanity to come closer, to let us hear and touch and see for ourselves so that we might find our way home to God. And in this story, Jesus, a Jew, a man, a rabbi, breaks all social boundaries to talk to a woman, a Samaritan, an outcast. He doesn't lecture her 
on any kind of sinfulness, but starts by asking for something from her. I'm thirsty. Will you give me a drink? Jesus doesn't start his relationship with this woman by saying, bless your heart. Let me fix you. I can see exactly all the places that you are broken. He starts instead by offering his own vulnerability. Jesus, our savior, the word who called all things into being, didn't stand on the high ground that he rightfully occupies and point out all of her faults. Rather, he emptied himself, becoming like us, becoming human, tired little masterpieces of dirt and stardust and God breath. So naturally, this woman is shocked that this man, any man, but this one in particular, is asking for anything from her. She's skeptical. Why did this man not bring a bucket? And faced with her shock, he says, I could help you with what you're really thirsty for as much as you could help me satisfy my thirst with this water. Jesus talks about the living water that he could give her. That's when she asks him about Jacob and this well. With this shared foundation, Jesus begins to reveal more and more about his identity. As a matter of fact, the text we read for today is the longest single conversation that Jesus has with anyone in any of the Gospels. I'm sure some of you all were thinking, man, this is a lot of scripture today. It is a long conversation. It's longer than Nicodemus longer than the one with Zacchaeus or Mary or Martha, or anyone else, this nameless Samaritan woman is the one recalled by John as the one that Jesus chose to have this conversation with. Jesus says, the water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Water is an important symbol In the Gospel of John, we hear repeatedly about John the Baptist. As a matter of fact, the beginning of our reading for today, Jesus has left Judea and is heading to Galilee because the Pharisees are angry that Jesus, well, not really Jesus, the parenthetical tells tells us, but his disciples is making and baptizing more disciples, more followers than John. People are religious leaders. They're always super competitive, right? Like, no, I have more people. No, he has more people. And the Pharisees are feeling threatened. Our gospel writer tells us the story of Jesus turning water into the best wine and the discussion about being born by water and the spirit. And now here we have this conversation at a well about water that springs up abundantly into eternal life. For first century folks, they would have understood eternal life more as a new quality of life right now, an abundant life that we experience right now, not so much as about being about heaven after death. So the woman asks for this water. She would like to have some of this abundant life. But then the story takes a sharp turn. Jesus says, go go call your husband and have, have him come back. The first hearers of this story would have probably been thinking, Oh, good, finally, like, here's the romance. I I picked it up. I thought it was going to be a rom-com. Yeah, talk about the husband. But we don't hear what we're expecting. The woman is not a blushing bride-to-be, but a wedding-weary woman. Some preachers love to play up the scandal of the woman's multiple husbands, characterizing the Samaritan as a serial divorcee or an unfaithful harlot. But these interpretations stray from the actual story, imposing some of our modern assumptions on a biblical text. Neither Jesus nor the gospel writer have any value statement about the five husbands. Jesus just confirms, yep, you told the truth, that's right. There's no value statement. It's likely that the woman's past is not her fault. After all, as a woman, she could not initiate a divorce. It could be that she's been widowed multiple times and had to remarry her original husband's brothers 
or closest other male kin because that was what it was like in the ancient world when you were considered property and have no rights or access to security apart from a husband, a father, or a son. So why does Jesus mention marriage? Some scholars suggest that the woman's husband symbolically represent either the five political powers that had ruled Samaria or the five groups that were rumored to comprise the original bloodline of the Samaritan people. Jesus could be alluding to Samaritan history. I mean, after all, if I were to stand in a room full of Texans, oh look, here I am, and mention six flags, we would all know our common history that there have been six flags flown to represent six countries that have been over the area we now call Texas. So maybe this betrothal type scene doesn't anticipate the marriage of a couple, but rather a renewed relationship of the Samaritans and their God. Jesus tells the woman that soon all people will no longer be divided by their worship, but they'll come together to honor God in spirit and in truth. I know the Messiah is coming, says the woman. And when he comes, he'll proclaim all things to us. The Samaritans, like the Jews, probably based in the same history, anticipated the arrival of a Messiah who they called the Teheb. A Samaritan document from the 3rd century BCE says the Teheb will come and reveal the truth. So when Jesus speaks the truth about this woman's life, about her history that probably no one beyond her village knew, she makes this hopeful comment, maybe he's the Messiah. And Jesus confirms her hope. I am he the one who is speaking to you. This right here is the first I am statement in the gospel of John. You might be familiar with lots of others of them. I am the way, I am the truth and the life. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. All of these metaphors building on God's I am statement to Moses in the burning bush. I am who I am. But here Jesus simply says, I am the Messiah. This is the central truth of the gospel of John. And the only time that Jesus reveals that truth directly to someone. Not only does Jesus know the Samaritan woman intimately, everything she's ever done. But he gives her the opportunity to know him in the same way. Not with any confusing parables, not with any metaphors, but directly and honestly. The gospel truth of Jesus' life is that he brings a new way of life, a way that results in all people, women, men, Samaritans, Jews, outsiders, insiders, all of us are invited to worship in spirit and in truth. This gospel becomes life-changing for the Samaritan woman's neighbors when she tells them about the Messiah and becomes the first and most effective evangelist of John's gospel. What starts as an encounter at a well in ancient Samaria with a tired, thirsty rabbi asking for physical water from a local woman becomes the offer of living water that truly satisfies Beloved of God, that is what is possible. We don't have to rely on our own strength or ingenuity. We don't have to keep sending our buckets down into our dry, dusty wells when there's nothing left in them to bring up. We can ask for the living water that God offers and never thirst again. This is the good news. Glory be to God. Amen.